Hey everyone, time for another video. As a departure from the majority Intel processors I've looked at recently, it's time for something a little bit on the red side. The AMD Athlon 64X2 6000 Plus, which I got sent by Patreon supporter Tazfee Dodge, who also sent me the higher clocked 6400 Plus that I tested a while back. The 6000 Plus was released in February of 2007 for AM2 socket motherboards and featured two cores with no form of hyper-threading or, as it was generically known, simultaneous multi-threading. Based on the Windsor architecture, it featured 243 million transistors, built on a 90 nanometer fabrication process and ran at 3 GHz. Although there was a Brisbane architecture based version of the 6000 Plus, built on the 65 nanometer fabrication process, which ran at 3.1 GHz instead, but featured half of the L2 cache that the Windsor variant had. And speaking of cache, the Windsor 6000 Plus has 256 KB of L1 cache per core and 1 MB of L2 cache per core as well. Memory-wise, it supported DDR2 RAM up to a maximum selectable frequency of 800 MHz, although one oddity with this processor is that due to the 6000 Plus's speed multiplier of 15 and how the memory clock is calculated, it won't actually run at 800 MHz. On the test system, it ran at 753.8 MHz. Initially, the launch price in the UK of the 6000 Plus was £300, which today is around £413 adjusting for inflation, or around $542 US dollars or €483. Euros. And although it is currently out of stock at CEX in the UK, it is listed for only £6, seemingly a bargain for a CPU once costing £300. You can also buy it on eBay in America for as little as $7.40 at the time of writing if you order it from South Korea. As usual, I'll be putting the 6000 Plus through its paces in Cinebench R20 and Firestrike Physics, including some games as well to give you an idea of just how it performs today. System-wise, I'm running an Asus M2NE SLI motherboard with 8GB of DDR2 RAM at 800MHz, a MSI GTX 1080 Armor OC Edition graphics card to eliminate any potential bottlenecks in performance. Windows 7 Ultimate 64-bit and the Fantex TC 14PE cooler to keep the Athlon cool. Next up is the still fairly new to the channel Cinebench R20, a benchmarking tool designed by Maxon based on their Cinema 4D engine, designed to test your processor's multi-core performance by rendering a photorealistic 3D image using all of your processor's available cores. I'll be running the benchmark a total of three times, which by the way took around one hour for all three runs, and averaging out the scores to give a reliable representation of what the 6000 Plus is capable of and at the stock speed of 3 GHz, or 3.015 GHz to be exact. The 6000 Plus managed scores across its three runs of 257, 257 and 257 for an average of, yep, you guessed it, 257, an average no one could have seen coming from those scores. Overclocking the 6000 Plus though works much the same as any other processor with a locked speed multiplier, in that you do it by increasing the base clock or front side bus speed. I managed a final clock of 3.3 GHz, which needed 220 MHz on the front side bus, with 1.4 volts. With the overclock, the 6000 Plus managed scores of 283, 282 and 283, for an average score of 282.67, a 9.99% increase over stock scores. Lastly, before moving into the games for today's test, it's the physics portion of the Firestrike Benchmark and 3 Mark suite of benchmarks. This specifically tests the processor's capability of physics calculations in games. And like Cinebench, I'm running the test three times as well, and averaging the scores out to give a reliable representation of what the 6000 Plus can manage. At stock speeds, the 6000 Plus managed scores across its three runs of 1906, 1930 and 1936 respectively, for an average score of 1924, 53.83% slower than the Pentium G2120 at stock speeds that I tested in the previous video. First up for the games today is the newest title in the test in terms of PC release dates, Rise of the Tomb Raider, the second game in the rebooted Tomb Raider series, which had its PC release in 2016 after a period of console exclusivity. I'm running the game at 1080p using the lowest settings possible with the DirectX 11 preset. An issue immediately noticeable is just how long the loading times are for this game, which has been a common theme in pretty much all of my tests today on this channel. That aside, the performance at both clocks is pretty bad to be honest, although less so with the overclock. At stock, 
the game audio occasionally likes to repeat itself or stutter pretty badly, which I didn't notice with the overclock. Stock also shows a large amount of stuttering throughout gameplay, with FPS dropping to the low 10s at the worst. The overclock though managed to reduce the stuttering massively, but it was definitely still there and made for just as jarring an experience as its stock clocks. Stock also showed some input lagging as well, which the overclock had no issues with and there were issues in both tests with minor texture popping at the wolf then as well, with the interior taking a few extra seconds to actually render fully, so watch out if you play it as it will lead to your death if you miss it. Throughout both the Soviet installation and copper mills, there was a very noticeable amount of stuttering at both speeds. Both also had issues with severe and complete lockups which lasted several seconds, and both also crashed 2-3 to three times during the test as well. The FRAPS 15 minute benchmark at stock clocks showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 26, 8 and 4 frames per second respectively, with a huge amount of spikes in frame times of around 160 milliseconds with the most severe lockups lasting around 1.4 to as much as 5.86 seconds at the worst. The overclock on the other hand managed 30, 11 and 8 frames per second for its average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates respectively. But that also showed very significant spikes in frame times of around 1.88 to 5.86 seconds at the worst, with multiple less severe spikes of around 120 milliseconds happening throughout the test as well. Next up is the ever popular CSGO, or Counter-Strike Global Offensive to give it its full name. It initially released in 2012 and maintains a huge professional scene today, as well as remaining popular among non-professionals as well. Again, I'm running this at 1080p on the lowest settings possible to maintain consistency with my previous tests, and I'm running the test in a hard difficulty competitive bot match on the Mirage map. Performance wise it should mostly be similar to the Athlon 64X to 6400+, plus I've tested in the past, just a tiny bit slower due to the 6000 plus's clock speed being 200MHz slower. Stock clocks showed some pretty noticeable micro stutter at times, and juddered briefly near the start of the test, and although the overclock had micro stutter issues throughout as well, I can't actually remember seeing the same juddering that I saw at stock clocks. That aside, there were no issues with input lag or locking at all, and overall both can be considered playable, at least for non-professional gameplay scenarios. Stock clocks showed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 46, 26 and 18 frames per second respectively, with the overclock showing a small improvement with average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 53, 30 and 22 frames per second respectively. Stock clocks also showed several spikes in frame times of around 40 to 80 milliseconds, with several more reaching from around 80 up to 160 milliseconds. The overclock also showed a lot of frame time spikes throughout the test as well, reaching up to around 60 milliseconds, with the worst hitting up to 140 milliseconds. Before we move on to the last game in the test today, it's GTA 5, the fifth main instalment in the Grand Theft Auto series of games which, after its console exclusivity ended, finally had its much anticipated PC release back in 2015, and four years on it remains a very popular game and a very worthwhile one to benchmark. I'm running both tests at 1080p with the lowest settings and with the DirectX 11 mode. As expected, it performed a bit worse than the 6400 Plus version of this processor did, given the 6000 Plus's lower clock speed. Both stock and overclock tests for the 6000 Plus showed the game to be pretty unplayable and an uncomfortable experience at best. FPS in the city and stock clocks could only manage to hit the high 20s at best, dipping into the high teens with some very noticeable stuttering occurring as well, which was pretty much the exact same story for the overclocked run too, with pretty similar frame rates and stutter throughout the city as well. Another issue I noticed on both runs is that the inputs would occasionally lock up, causing driving to be a bit difficult, but certainly not impossible. The stutter I noticed in the city also persisted throughout the whole game, just not as severely, and it was also noticeable in the desert area of the map as well. There was also some noticeable locking up of the inputs in the desert area, but again it didn't have an effect on driving that much. The FRAPS 15 minute benchmark showed that for stock clocks it managed average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 22, 9 and 5 frames per second respectively, with extremely inconsistent frame times which you would have seen represented as the stutter in the game and spikes in frame times of around 60 to 280 milliseconds at the worst. The overclock fared a little bit better, with average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 27, 13 and 10 frames per second respectively, 
with frame times which were also pretty inconsistent and with spikes in frame times of around 130 milliseconds, with the worst spike hitting 280 milliseconds. And for the last game in the test today, it's time to end on a personal favourite, Warframe, a free to play game that had its initial release back in 2013 and is available through Steam or the Warframe website itself. I'll be running the game at, you guessed it, 1080p with the lowest settings possible in DirectX 11 mode. DirectX 10 mode is also selectable through the launcher, and I'm also running the test in our survival mission on Jupiter. I had a little run about the lander craft at first, and at stock, the game did stutter a little bit, but still maintained FPS in the high 70s to around the 140 frames per second range. The overclock showed no stuttering on the ship, and hit as high as 150 frames per second there as well. There was also very minor stuttering on the planet selection screen too, with the overclock showing similar stutter, just not as much. In the mission itself though, both tests were overall pretty playable, although stock clocks did show some noticeable stutter on occasion with FPS dipping to around 40 and hitting as high as 70 frames per second, depending on your location on the map. The overclock though didn't really hit much higher than 70 FPS either, but the FPS didn't drop as much, around 50 FPS in this case. There were however some dips in the overclock test's FPS to 39 frames per second during most intense scenes, but saying that, I got into some bigger battles in the overclocked run than I did on stock clocks, so it wouldn't be fair to say that stock clocks could run better. Despite the more intense combat at times, the overclock did in fact still score better in the benchmark, with average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates of 53, 35 and 30 frames per second respectively, whereas stock clocks managed 50, 29 and 25 frames per second for its average 1% and 0.1% low frame rates respectively. And looking at the frame time graph, there were several spikes in frame times at stock clocks of around 40 to 70 milliseconds, with one hitting 100 milliseconds at the worst. The overclock showed several spikes in frame times as well, although not as severe, at up to 40 milliseconds, with a couple hitting 60 milliseconds during the test as well. Overall, the 6000 Plus can be problematic in trying to run reasonably modern games, and certainly wouldn't be recommendable even for a really low budget gaming system at all. In general browsing wise it would probably do alright, but gaming wise it really struggles. Due to the limited overclocking headroom there isn't really much room to improve upon stock performance, although in older games than this test the overclock would probably have made a more noticeable difference. It also costs a lot more today than several far better performing Core 2 Duo processors and uses substantially more power as well. If you enjoyed this video please consider giving it a like and leaving a comment as well. I'd also really appreciate it if you could share this with anyone you think may enjoy it. If you'd like to support me in creating these videos, you could subscribe to my channel and maybe even consider supporting me through my Patreon at patreon.com slash benchinggaming or through Kofi at kofi.com slash benchinggaming. You really don't have to, but I'd be eternally grateful if you did. A special thanks also goes out to Patreon supporter Tazfe Dodge for sending me the processor to test. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the video and learned something from it. Hopefully I'll see you in the next one. And if not, thanks for taking the time out of your day to watch my content. I really do appreciate it. Mm -hmm.